of Gwynedd, a picturesque town on North Wales's Cambrian coast, reputedly the inspiration for one of the locations in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, supposedly the home of the mythical Barmouth monster, uh, otherwise known as the Beast of Barmouth, a mysterious creature of which there have been various sightings sporadically reported since the 1830s. However, Barmouth is also the setting for this staple of 70s pulp guy n smith's night of the crabs first published in 1976 the year of that blazing endless summer which also happened to be the summer which followed the uk release of jaws all of which coincided to provide perfect conditions for the success of a schlocky holiday publication such as this one um, smith's book was a runaway success and cemented his status as a horror writer the book spawned five sequels and also a prequel now, Guy N. Smith's history and profile have been fairly well documented. Uh, Guy Newman Smith was born in November 1939 in Staffordshire and has been described in one biography as a prolific English writer best known for his pulp fiction style horror, uh, though he has also written non-fiction, softcore pornography and children's literature quite a CV. Smith's mother was the pre-war novelist E.M. Wheel, who always encouraged him from childhood to write, uh, although Smith is also well known for his love of country pursuits, particularly shooting. Uh, I think his earliest published works were for sporting magazines, and in 2003 Guy N. Smith was declared the winner of the British Pipe Smoking Championship. He's known as an active pro-smoking campaigner. Night of the Crabs largely adopts the 50s science fiction device of a creepy crawly of choice mutating into an extra large form, running amok and threatening civilization, and proving weirdly immune to any conventional form of weaponry. The cover treatment of this early edition gives no ambiguity about what we're in for. Uh, it's a classic 70s airbrush treatment of this dirty great crustacean. There's blood dripping from what I suppose are its mandibles. There's a busted warning sign beneath its legs, presumably for purposes of scale, so we realise it's big. Um, it's interesting that the cover copy aligns the book to James Herbert's similarly schlocky debut novel of a couple of years previous to this, uh, which similarly launched that writer onto a meteoric trajectory. Um, if you're still in doubt about what you're in for, each chapter break also features a line drawing of the cover star. Um, so anyway, we open in chapter one to a somewhat idyllic view of Barmouth Harbour where Ian and Julie, an attractive young couple, are clumsily expositing over Ian's Uncle Cliff, who is one of the country's leading botanists, and he isn't 40 yet. Note this for future significance within the story. Um, anyway, they're plotting a trip to Shell Island, which is an expanse to the north of Barmouth, which lies adjacent to a small airfield. They turn up there the following day, where Julie is perturbed to learn that the airfield is a military base used for experimental drones, and the sinister quality of this weaponry is not lost on her. Finding themselves conveniently alone on Shell Island's bathing beach, it appears at first as if Ian and Julie are going to get straight down to some nasty business. Uh, Ian glanced down at the front of his bathing trunks. Julie always made him feel like that. Damn her. Um, the book doesn't quite reward us at this point with a spicy scene, not so early in the narrative. So they opt uh, for a swim instead, somewhat inadvisedly perhaps. Within minutes, Ian has lost sight of Julie, and it's starting to bother him. Stupid bitch. No, she's again visible ahead. Once again, Ian's thoughts begin to turn to an alfresco bunk up on the beach. 
until there's a scream and Julie disappears. Treading water above a sandbank, Ian notices a ripple heading his way and suddenly he's screaming too. Something that could only be compared to a pair of garden shears has grabbed his leg and he's about to go the same way as Julie. We cut from here to Uncle Cliff Davenport's laboratory where Cliff is still vainly expecting his nephew and fiance to turn up. Uh, at this point we get to know a little more about Cliff. His lithe figure was as sprightly as ever and the pipe drooping out of the corner of his mouth reminded him of the time when he had portrayed Sherlock Holmes in a local amateur dramatic society's representation of the speckled band. Now, perhaps Guy is indulging in a little bit of self-identification with this main character. <laughs> we go further into the mindset of Cliff. He knew Julie would automatically prepare him something to eat. Is he, <laughs> is he a master pile of laundry for her too? Um, in any case, Cliff is going to have to go hungry. At this point, there's a knock on the door from the Merioneth Bobbies and we know what's coming next. Chapter 2 sees Cliff back in his West Hampstead flat, where we're told he does no work, he eats little, and he consumes on average about an ounce of tobacco a day. Uh, now, I don't know if that's good or bad. Is that a lot? Is that a little? I, I don't know. Um, anyway, the, rest <laughs> the restlessness is clearly getting to him. After a couple of days, Dissatisfied with the efforts of the Welsh police, Cliff feels he has to know what's happened. He has a funny feeling there's more to this than meets the eye. So he hops into the Cortina and makes the schlep up to, and I'm going to struggle to pronounce this, Chlambedre, Chlambedre. Having booked himself into his customary hotel in that location on failing to pronounce. Cliff decides he's going to stake out Crab Island. On arrival he's immediately taken by surprise by, uh, he's buzzed by one of the RAF's low-flying drones. Um, at this point you'd expect uh, these devices or the RAF's presence there to take on some kind of greater significance to the story. Anyway, turning his attention back to the beach, Cliff notices that along the tideline there are marks in the sand which he quickly identifies as giant-sized impressions of crab claws, him being a botanist and everything. Impossible, he thinks to himself. He's a rational man after all. Uh, with his curiosity aroused, Cliff decides he's going to have a nose at the RAF base. He's going to see if perhaps the drone's undercarriage might it might have a similar signature in sand to a giant crab. Naturally, he's caught snooping and some stern MOD types hustle Cliff off to, into an interrogation block in which boyhood dreams of the Foreign Legion, which of us have never had those, suddenly start to become reality. Fortunately, Cliff is able to talk his way out of the Gestapo-style grilling he's, he's undergoing by calling in a favour from a Whitehall connection he happens to have cultivated, uh, Sir Ronald Bradley. Uh, a quick phone call to this minister magically sorts everything out. So Cliff drags himself back to the hotel in time for his evening meal, uh, where his hostess informs him that they're a bit pushed for room and that he's going to have to share a table with a Mrs. Benson, whose husband, we learn, a real rotter, happens to have left her last year. You'll like her. Cliff has clapped eyes on her already, uh, particularly, uh, we're told, the outline of her small firm. <coughs> Classic grief reaction. <laughs> Anyhow, um, it turned, from their conversation, it turns out that Pat Benson has noticed the crab marks too, uh, having had since childhood a particular interest in the imprints which crustaceans make. They quickly hypothesise that uh, there must be 
submarine life around these islands that man has never dreamt of. Uh, at some point, Pat's now ringless hand is making contact with cliffs, reigning in their baser instincts at least until the following day. Next morning, Cliff's wild postulations are confirmed by the news that there have been further disappearances in the area, and a walk to the beach yields further crab tracks. Cliff has by now formed a full prognosis of, of these giant beasties moving around by night, but who other than Pat is going to believe him without proof? Cliff resolves to come back and observe that same night, but what is this? Pat wants to come with him? Now look here, this is no job for a woman. However, Pat is, you know, a spunky sort of girl. Uh, you know, spunky in the original sense of the word. So anyway, that evening, Pat and Cliff set out for Shell Island on foot. What a beautiful night, exclaims Pat. If only we didn't have to worry about giant crabs. So there they are, alone on the dunes on a warm night, and I think we all know what's coming next. The grotty sex scene that you know you can guarantee in a book such as this. Cliff has got Pat's bra off in two shakes of a lamb's tail, and we're away. Guy spares us none of the detail here. We get the whiteness of her thighs and the dark triangle of her soft, fluffy hair, which is withholding secrets. Secrets of men who had lain there. Men who had been sexually satisfied beyond their wildest dreams. You know, if, if women want to know what men are really thinking at a moment like this, who else has been up here? <laughs> anyway, no matter, because Pat is bathing it in the warm river of her desire, and blah, 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 until the violent eruption that doesn't come a minute too soon. I'm more than glad I let you come with me tonight, confides Cliff generously. I'm afraid, though, we must still keep an eye open for those crabs. Well, that's that's what you want to hear at a moment like that, isn't it? Um, I, I just... <laughs> I, I, I hope this is Guy having a laugh with us. I hope this is... I hope... This is, guy, this is deliberate. I hope this is Guy having a laugh with the reader and slipping, slipping that one in as a joke. Anyway, all well and good because within minutes of consummating their act, Cliff and Pat are confronted with real world evidence of the existence of the crabs who come scuttling out of the sea and proceed to turn into mincemeat. A character named Bartholomew, who is one of many characters who've been inserted into the narrative here purely for the purpose of crab food. Bartholomew is... <laughs> I suppose a local simpleton, to put it bluntly. But anyway, this, this horde of crabs comes scuttling out of the sea, makes short work of Bartholomew, and present Guy and Pat with sufficient evidence for Guy to make an immediate prognosis of their entire social order, including the dominance of King Crab, which is the largest and most alpha of them. Cliff realises from all this that his job now must be to convince the authorities, which brings us to one of those customary horror story conundrums of how to convince the powers that be in the existence of something that defies all rationality. Cliff, however, achieves this with remarkable ease, getting through without too much difficulty to a minister named Grisdale, who gives Cliff the, uh, if it was anybody else but you, Cliff, I'd have them certified sort of treatment, but immediately agrees anyway to send a Colonel Good down to Wales to check on the situation. However, we're not immediately out of the woods because Colonel Good on arrival turns out to be a complete buffoon. The character of British military idiocy of Crimean war levels, all moustache and jowls. He heads straight to the pub on arrival to load up on whiskey. Uh, he's all about the expenses paid trip and has no interest whatsoever in Cliff and his crabs. The following chapter begins with the establishment of a character that we just know has been thrown into the narrative purely as crab bait, a device we're going to see repeated from here until the end of the book. Uh, in this case it's a sentry on night duty at the airbase on Shell Island, all alone with his thoughts and clearly unhappy with his lot. 
Who'd want to pinch one of those drones, he wonders. The recurring phrase within this section, or even on this page, is he couldn't understand. He couldn't understand why they'd let Guy go the other day. He couldn't understand why he couldn't sit in one of the huts. He couldn't understand why anyone would want to go to the moon. Uh, apparently our, our nameless guard is a bit of a dullard, but that is academic in any case because he has an impending appointment with a crab's digestive system. It's at this point that we begin to learn something of the crab's imperviousness to weaponry. Uh, Trooper X's bullets and subsequent bursts from the guard's tower, as well as a pair of snipers on the base, just ricochet off the crab shells like pea shooter. Um, anyhow, there are surviving witnesses to this attack, so now the authorities do have to take notice. Uh, Grisdale shows up himself. Uh, he start, also starts on the whiskey shots, but he at least takes the time to get the low down from Cliff, who by now has worked out every bloody thing about these crabs and their ways. Uh, Grisdale Dale agrees to throw in the army anyway, and before we get to that inevitable confrontation, we are party to another excruciating sex scene between Cliff and Pat. Um, Guy, is it, <laughs> is it worth pointing out again, Guy, Guy N. Smith actually wrote soft porn books um, on the basis of <laughs> on the basis of the sex scenes in this we may need to work on <laughs> we may need to work ourselves up to those um, but anyway um, at this point with it we're now introduced to Sam Owen who is another item of crab fodder who's chosen to ignore the, the public warnings and indulge in a bit of night fishing Sam's demise is merely the prelude to the Battle of Barmouth in which the British army take on the crabs who are also so prove immune to the shells from centurion tanks so obviously aren't going to be bothered by small arms fire and hand grenades so the army failed to score a single crustacean casualty in this encounter and we're now talking about crabs as a threat to civilization as a whole uh, a civilization whose fate seems to lie in cliff's hands um, he's agreed to go diving off the cambrian coast to locate whichever submarine cave must serve as their hideout so he's so, so the Navy can then pitch in with a haul of demolition charges and seal the crustaceans in. Uh, Cliff locates this uh, with, with his customary ease, and after a tense spot in which one of the monsters chooses to enter the burrow shortly after he has, uh, luckily his oxygen holds out just long enough for him to be able to make a getaway, although he is unable to make it back to the boat in time, which gives everybody the impression that he also has been filleted. Um, so having made his way back independently he barges his way back into Grisdale's HQ back in Barmouth clearly peeved at having been written off so quickly and flinging recriminatory barbs around the place but at least he is able to give the now grieving Pat a nice surprise on his on his return to the hotel. Um, however, it turns out that because Cliff is the man who knows the way, it falls onto him the, to plant this bomb. On the following day, the detonation charge in question turns out to be the size of a Mills bomb, which is a British infantry hand grenade. Are you sure that's enough? Certainly, it's not enough for anybody to hear this explosion from the land when it happens, which is prime for an hour, hour's time after Cliff laying it. But um, everybody seems to go on the assumption that this has done the job. So, <laughs> feeling themselves out of the woods now, Cliff and Pat go for a leisurely hillside walk in order to discuss their future together. But guess what then begins to crawl from a hillside burrow? Yes, that didn't work. And King King Crab is still at the head of his army. Uh, so we're back to square one. And at this stage, we've got about this much of this book to, for all this to be resolved in. Another un unpromising encounter between Cliff and yet another British military idiot. Uh, this is before a spell of bad weather offers everybody a bit of a reprieve because Crabs apparently go to ground during a storm. Anyway, with that over, we're introduced to our final sacrificial lamb, who is Di Peters, a train driver who is at the helm of the service from Dolgethlai to Barmouth. I'm not even sure that line was still in service in 1976, but anyway. Um, we learn that Di has been plagued by ugly premonitions of something bad happening to him along this very stretch. And of course it does. <laughs> the crabs aren't going to be phased by a standard gauge 
diesel multiple unit travelling at moderate speed. So Dai, along with his, his haul of passengers, take a spectacular dive off of the Mordak railway bridge into the waters below. As it turns out, the crabs have been hiding out in the estuary this whole time, and with about eight pages to go, we're still agonising for an answer. Uh, they must have an Achilles heel, uh, and not for the first time nuclear weaponry is considered. <laughs> uh, anyway, Cliff suddenly receives the moment of inspiration when, when he reads a report in the local paper of a local kid dying after drinking Paraquat weed killer, which of course crustaceans can't deal with. And bingo, we're all Way, industrial volumes of said chemical are commandeered along with a helicopter and in a climactic scene that has since been echoed in Garth Marenghi's War of the Wasps Cliff zooms in at low altitude and gives them a dose of chemical oblivion saving King Crab for last who shakes a defiant claw at Cliff before sinking beneath the waves so there we are prob <laughs> problem solved done and dusted packaged up very neatly though naturally there's a bit of a question as to a final finality of the crab's demise which of course leaves space for the sequels that we just know are going to follow and that's your lot it's a zip along train journey type of read or a toilet read you can blaze through this book in the space of a couple of maybe three hours and you can either pick up the sequel or just switch tracks to something a little less um silly um smith though does execute his task with a kind of ruthless pulpy efficiency practically every question mark that the plot brings up is swiftly resolved with extraordinary efficiency one question mark that isn't resolved where did these crabs come from how did they happen you would might have guessed from the initial chapters that it would have been something to do with that ref base some kind of military research tipping nature's balance uh, as i think happens in stephen king's the mist uh, but we never find out um presumably the answer to this is, is in one of the sequels or the prequel i don't know apart from the suspension of disbelief and a high tolerance for stupidity the book makes no great demands of the reader but it churns out schlocky thrills grotty sex scenes and presumably unintentional laughs in slam bang succession yes it is replete with monodimensional characters and of its time casual sexism <laughs> and the overall effect it's about on the level of a comic book with most of the pictures removed or you could say it reads like it had been written by a 14 year old but then you may argue that that is just knowing your audience night of the crabs is a tantalizingly unwholesome stick of literary bubblegum the chances are major league blockbusters and classics aside that this book probably outsold many on your own favorites list and more to the point guy n smith as his bibliography does testify got a real career out of this other titles from the same author including death bell Thirst, Slime Beast. We'll get to those, don't worry. Anyway, thank you again for joining me here at Bird's Books. For my next review, I'm planning to have a look at David Wiltshire's Nightmare Man, a novel that was serialised by the BBC in 1981. Until then, thank you again and do join me next time. Don't know where she's been